Okay, in this video, I'm going to tell you about concatenation of paths and loops and use it to define the fundamental group of a topological space. So let X be a topological space. And suppose alpha and beta are paths. such that alpha at time 1 equals beta at time 0. Alpha does this, stops somewhere, and then beta continues from the same point. So this is the point where they one starts and the other takes over. So we can define a new path, which is the concatenation of these two. Um, define the concatenation. Which I'm going to write beta dot alpha, because I'm thinking of this like function com composition, like if you do alpha first, then beta. You'll often see this, for example, in Hatch's book written the other way round. I prefer this because later on when we look at monodromy, um, the paths do indeed give us functions and uh, the monodromy will then be a holomorphism rather than an anti-holomorphism. But anyway, that's how I'm writing it. And it's defined to be the path that starts here, goes along alpha and then goes along beta. But unfortunately, you know, naively, that doesn't look like a path, the way we define paths, because it starts at time zero, gets to here at time one, and then gets to the end of beta at time two, but we're only allowed paths that are parameterized by zero to one. So of course you can allow paths that are parameterized by any interval, but it makes the theory a little bit more complicated. They call them more paths, M-O-O-R-E. So we're going to stick to paths parameterized by 0, 1. And that means we have the slightly cumbersome definition that beta concatenated with alpha at time t is alpha of 2t if t is between 0 and a half. In other words, you do alpha at double speed. And then at time half, beta takes over. And then you have to use 2t minus 1. Let's check that does the right thing. At time a half, 2t minus 1 is 0. So you do indeed get to beta of 0 at time a half. And then at t equals 1, you get to 2 times 1 minus 1, that's 1. You get to beta equals 1. So beta of 1. So this is alpha of 0. This is alpha of 1, which equals beta of 0. And this is also equal to beta dot alpha of a half. Now, it was important for this to work that alpha and beta matched up at the end point of alpha and beginning point of beta. So given a topological space x and a single base point little x in x, let's uh, write Omega, capital Omega, subscript X of X for the set of all loops based at little x. Right, so this is an enormous space. Right, that's a loop based at x. The constant loop is based at x. This is a loop based at x. This is a loop based at x. There's an infinite dimensional space of loops based at x in a suitable sense. 
so this is a huge space um, we'll write pi 1 of x based at x for the equivalence classes of loops subject to the equivalence relation of being homotopic um, i.e. Uh, gamma is equivalent to delta if gamma is homotopic based homotopic to delta and now I claim that's a much much smaller set it's not obvious but it's believable right because homotopies can do all sorts of crazy things to loops and we've already seen that in Rn there's only one homotopy class of loops based at the origin so this is much much smaller than the set of all loops and now the claim is we can make pi 1 of x based at x into a group under concatenation in other words if bracket alpha in pi 1 x denotes the homotopy class the equivalence class up to homotopy of the loop alpha and similarly for beta then the group product of beta and alpha in the fundamental group pi 1 of x is going to be just the homotopy class of the concatenation now there's a number of things about this that require justification first of all it's not clear that this is a well-defined group operation because it could be that by picking different betas and alphas in the same homotopy classes you somehow obtain a different homotopy class of concatenation now that doesn't happen of course but you've got to prove that it doesn't happen in other words that concatenation descends to the fundamental group and makes sense on the level of equivalence classes that's one thing next you need to prove that it's a group right you need to check there's an identity that there are inverses that it's associative and I'm going to leave almost all of this as an exercise um, for class but I'm going to prove that there's an identity so what is the identity in the fundamental group What loop could I concatenate with to change nothing? Well, what about the constant loop? The one that sends every point in time to the base point. If I concatenate with this, then I do my loop and then stay put or I stay put for half the time and then I do the, the loop at double speed so that gives me the same loop it looks exactly the same but they're not equal right so alpha is not equal to alpha dot epsilon because alpha dot epsilon is the loop which at time t is constant if t is less than a half and it's alpha of 2t minus 1 if t is bigger than a half 
first, looking up at the definition of concatenation. So this two t minus one. So it really stays put for half the time, then goes around at twice the speed. So it's not the same loop, but it is homotopic. So this identity is not an identity for concatenation on loops. It's an identity for concatenation on homotopy classes of loops. That's why we have to take the fundamental group rather than just working with loops. So I need to prove this. I need to prove that alpha is homotopic to alpha dot epsilon. That'll prove that epsilon is the identity in the fundamental group. So to that end, I'm going to draw a square, which is going to be the domain of our homotopy. I'm going to write down a homotopy from alpha dot epsilon to alpha. Um, so I, I'm going to call the loops where s is fixed gamma s. This would be like gamma s here. So what is gamma zero? Gamma zero is going to be uh, alpha dot epsilon. In other words, that's the loop that stays put at the constant at the base point for half the time, and then it does alpha at double speed for the rest of the time that we move this gamma. And gamma one is the loop alpha that's just normal speed alpha. Okay, how am I going to interpolate between these two loops? Remember, all the time the base points have to stay fixed. Well, here's the trick. I'm going to draw a straight line from the midpoint of this edge down to this corner. I'm going to say, when I'm above that line, gamma s is going to do alpha at whatever speed it needs to to get from start to finish. When I'm below that line, I'm going to do the constant loop. So I'm going to stay where I am for this long, then I'm going to go around alpha. And I'm going to stay for slightly less time and then go around alpha, stay for slightly less time, go around alpha, until eventually I just go around alpha. So how do I write that in formulae? Well, gamma s of t, which is the same as writing h of s comma t, remember, um, is constant when t is below this line. So when t is less than a half minus a half s. Right, when s is zero, you have t less than a half. When s is one, you have t less than zero. So this happens for no time at all. Okay, so that's in this region here that I do this. And then above this straight line, I'm going to do alpha. I'm going to do alpha at such a speed that I get from start to finish in the relevant time. And I start off doing it at double speed. I finish doing it at normal speed. So the, sp the speed should interpolate between those two, starting off at 2, ending up at 1. So the speed should be 2 minus s t. And then there should be some constant term. And I claim the constant term is plus s minus 1 because here remember the constant term is minus 1 it's 2t minus 1 that's the argument and at the end the constant term is 0 so we have to go from minus 1 up to 0 in time 1 so that's this constant term and this formula is used when t is bigger than or equal to a half minus s over t so all I've done is change the parameterization of the loop. I've changed the length of time it should stay still, and I've changed the speed at which it continues around. And this is continuous. All of the different functions involved are continuous. You might worry that it looks like I've defined it in different ways in different places, so it shouldn't be continuous, right? It's defined one way below this line and defined another way above this line. 
So why should it be continuous across the line? Well, there's a lemma that we're going to prove in the section of this course on topological spaces, which says a sort of piecewise defined function, so a piecewise continuous function defined on two closed regions, two closed sets like these two, this one and this one, is continuous if the the piecewise pieces or the pieces agree on the overlap on the region where the two closed sets overlap and here that means they have to agree along this line and along this line alpha of whatever this argument is, is um, alpha of zero, right? That's the way we set it up. So along this line, we have alpha of zero. Alpha of zero is the base point because alpha is a loop based at the base point. So all the way along this line, this second piece of the function gives us x and the first piece certainly gives us x because it gives us x everywhere. So this lemma is something we will uh, we'll see later, maybe as an exercise. And it applies here to say that actually h is a continuous function. So h is a homotopy from alpha dot epsilon to alpha. So that proves that epsilon is an identity with a fundamental group. And it's going to be an exercise for you guys to prove that uh, inverses exist and that it's an associative product, which involves similar but more complicated diagrams.